the truth, and nothing but the truth. This is GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Then we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Hello and welcome to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson. So glad you're with us today. B.J. Clark is with me. And B.J., always great to be with you as we talk about biblical themes. So glad to be here. B.J., today we address uh, a question that we ought to give some due consideration to. Why do people lose their faith? Yeah. The Bible has a lot to say about the faith mm -hmm. and the blessings associated with being in the faith. And yet we know that there are some people that make shipwreck of their faith. And, and so the, in, in looking at Scripture, the devil is identified as the adversary of man. And Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so his, his goal is to circumvent the faith of people. And maybe in a nutshell, B.J., why do people lose their faith? What happens? Yeah. There are uh, so many examples. One that comes to mind because it has almost the exact phraseology that you just used is in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, Paul talks to Timothy about some of the <clears throat> younger widows. And he said uh, in verse 11, uh, when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And they learn to be idle and they're wandering about from house to house and uh, <coughs> speaking things they should not speak, he says. So um, the point that's made here in this passage of Scripture is that these younger widows started getting attracted by something to replace their devotion to Christ. And they threw off, cast off their first faith. Uh, Demas hath forsaken me, why did he cast world. off his faith? Because he loved this present world. Satan tries the same stuff today that he tried in the Garden of Eden to get Eve to cast off her faith in right. God. He, it's false doctrine. Yeah, you know, B.J., in 1 Timothy chapter 5, the passage you read a moment ago, in context it talks about those who have already turned aside yeah. after Satan. Yes. And so maybe one of the things in order to maybe lay the foundation, because I know that there are a lot of folks in the world today that have this idea, once saved, always saved. And what they would say to us is, once you become a child of God, you can never lose your faith. So what you guys are talking about is foreign to me. Never been taught that, never heard that. Matter of fact, don't believe it. Right. Well, we have to establish what the Bible teaches. And so to those that would say, you can't fall from grace, how do you counter that? Because what we're talking about is, how does a person lose their faith? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, as you notice the passage we just mentioned, leading up to it, he mentions those who won't provide for their own. And he said, if, the, if they're that way, they've denied the faith, and then they're worse than an infidel. Now, let's think about this. Is an infidel lost or saved? Well, an infidel is lost. How could someone that is a brother who refuses to provide for their family be worse than an infidel who is lost and be saved? How do you make someone worse than someone that's in that position? And 2 Peter chapter 2 makes this abundantly clear. He says, uh, it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it to turn from it. You mentioned some have turned aside after Satan. And the passage mentions who, some who'd cast off their first faith. The reason I can cast off this jacket is because I have it on. I've That's been right. wearing it. And Galatians 3 says, you've been baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. But the one who's put on Christ can make a deliberate decision like the Galatians were. That's right. To put him off and to go back to Judaism in which case Paul says, you, you do that, you've fallen from grace, That's Galatians exactly. 5, 4. Good, so, B.J., when you look at the Scriptures, it's abundantly oh. clear somebody could fall from grace. You mentioned 1 Timothy chapter 5. In chapter 6, verse 20, Paul said, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Why? Avoiding the profane and vain babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. 
by professing it, listen to this, some have strayed concerning what? The faith. Yes. And then he said, grace be with you, amen. So BJ, you know, we're looking at it in black and white. And, and you mentioned 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. In verse 15, I believe, Peter said, some have forsaken the right, the right way. Yes. So, he doesn't say they were never in the right way. He said they forsook it. Uh, you can't forsake something that you've never embraced. And right. they had uh -huh. embraced the right way, but then after that they forsook it. That's right. So, so B.J., in, in light of plain, clear-cut, concise, textual evidence, how in the world could anybody say, once saved, always saved? Well, if you think about it, it's a very comforting doctrine to those who want to live pretty much the way they want to live because it says Christ will save you and then pretty much you can do what you want. Or if you don't want to go to church, don't worry about it. You're still saved. If you, now I know some of their arguments are that, well, no, if someone acts like that, that just proves they were never really saved to begin with. But that can't be so because uh, Paul says in the book of Hebrews, and I think Paul probably wrote it, in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, Take heed, brethren. They were brothers in Christ, but they were leaving the law of Christ to go back to the law of Moses. And he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Right. And he says, You need to exhort one another to keep that from happening, because if we hold our confidence firm to the end, then indeed we'll be partakers of His glory and salvation. So the Bible is abundantly clear that eternal security is available for the believer as long as he remains a believer. Well, that's right. But the okay. same person that can choose to become a believer can decide to become an unbeliever. Uh, and if he does that, then he has made his choice. Well, B.J., you mentioned Demas a moment ago. Second yeah. Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul said, He has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Well, in Philemon, Verse 24, the one chapter, Paul in writing to Philemon spoke of Demas as a fellow laborer. Right. Now, if he wasn't in the faith, how could he have been a fellow laborer? Paul would not have said that if he had not been genuine Christian. Paul would have said, well, that just proves Demas was never really what we thought he was. No, Demas hath forsaken me. That's right. Having loved this present world. Uh, again, forsaking implies a former embrace. That's exactly and, right. And Demas had uh, deliberately walked away from his uh, faith. All right, B.J., before we get back to why people leave the faith, one other passage, and I know that this is one of the sugar stick passages, John chapter 10. Jesus said, verse 28, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me. He's greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. So they're going to say, see, once you become a child of God, no one can take your salvation from you. So, in context, how do you counter it? You know, verse 28 <clears throat> is connected to verse 27. The them of verse 28 that will never perish are the people described in verse 27. My sheep, one, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Show me a man that quits hearing the voice of Christ, that quits following Christ, and I'll show you a man that is not described in verse 28. That's right. Because the description in verse 28 of those who will never perish is hinged to those in verse 27 who hear his voice and follow him. And he knows them. Show me someone that continues to hear his voice, continues to follow him. I'll show you eternally, uh, someone eternally secure, because never can Satan take someone against their will away from Christ. But if you show me a man that says, no, I won't listen to Jesus anymore, and I won't follow him anymore, the preposterous notion of some is Jesus is kind of a you know, stuck and has to save you anyway, even though you'd completely abandoned him. That's right. So, so BJ, basically, if we honor the Word of God, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31, if you abide in my Word, then yeah. you're my disciples indeed. So what if you don't abide in his Word? I think the implication is obvious. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, hereby we do know that we know him. How? How do we know him? 
we keep His commandments. There you go. So, so as long as we stay connected to His Word, walking in the light, First John chapter one verse seven. What does it mean to walk in the light? I remember Brother Guyan Wood saying many years, many, many many years ago. He said it means to walk in accordance with the Word of God. Right. And and so he said, you know, look, if you walk in the light, then you have full confidence, full assurance. What? Blood of Christ continually working in your life. But he said, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, he said, we lie and do not the truth. So if we want to make sure that our relationship is intact, how do we do that? Follow His Word. And you think about it, Mike. <clears throat> if, why wouldn't John say, if we walk in darkness, well, that just proves we never really were in the light to begin with. He doesn't argue that way. He doesn't. He points <clears throat> out that someone who's been walking in the light could choose to suddenly walk in darkness. That's their choice. That's exactly and right. And they don't have to do it. And we're not suggesting that we're living in constant fear of not having our salvation. First John 5.13 says you can know you have a sal eternal salvation. That's right. You can know it. That's exactly but right. the same passage that says that just two or three verses later talks about a brother sending a sin unto death. Now, what versus a brother who sins a sin that's not unto death? And you say, well, what? How do I unravel that and make any sense of that? The sin that is unto death is the sin the man won't repent of because right. if we confess our sins, faithful he's to faithful us. to forgive us. So the sin that's a sin unto death is the sin the brother won't repent of. That's exactly. But right. if a sinner will repent of his sin, then it's not unto death. But what if he doesn't repent of it? It is unto death. And that's not physical death because we all do that. We all right. die physically whether we're lost or saved. That's the second death, the lake of fire and brimstone, that's right. Revelation 21.8. That's right. And you know, you appeal to 1 John chapter 1 in verse 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Based on that verse alone, we know He's writing to Christians. Yes. Because that's God's second law of pardon, right. not God's first law of pardon. He's not writing to people who are unbelievers. He's writing to people who are in the faith. Exactly. Uh, chapter 2, verse 25, this is the promise that He's promised us, eternal life. Well, who's He promised that to? Those who are in the Word, those who are in the faith. Exactly right. Uh, B.J., in Matthew chapter 13, we have Jesus talking about the different types of hearts, and He uses different types of soil to represent the human heart. And He talks about those who stumble, who lose their faith, one of which would be a class of people who allow tribulation, persecution, verse 21, to cause them to stumble. So when we ask the question, why do people lose their faith? Right. Some folks under duress, in, in times of duress, uh, in a situation where uh, the heat is on, as we would say, they stumble and fall, persecution, tribulation. Wouldn't the Apostle Peter be an example of somebody who basically capitulated in a time of duress. You remember uh, Jesus has been apprehended and, you know, claims are made that, you know, you're one of His disciples. And Peter, the, uh, Matthew tells us, he cursed and swore and said, I don't even know the man. Right. So is it possible for persecution, tribulation, to cause people to abandon the faith? Obviously it is. And the Lord says in Luke's account of this same story that, uh, uh, those on the rock, verse 13, when they hear, receive the word with joy, these have no root. That's the problem. They for a while believe. Interesting. He doesn't say they never believed. That's right. But it's so temporary. They believe for a while and then in time of temptation fall away. And so, as you noted, one of the very things that Jesus identified as the source of causing some to fall away is trials and tribulations. Uh, and that's one reason why Paul says, look, you think I'm not a genuine Christian, Corinthians? <laughs> if I were not a genuine Christian, then would I have gone through all these tribulations, right. all these persecutions, and have not walked away from it? Uh, he says, look, I have proven my genuineness by the persecutions I've endured and my continued faithfulness thereafter. Absolutely. Absolutely. B.J., in this same context, Jesus mentions those who have the opportunity to hear the Word, and that Word, well, actually, He talks about that seed that fell among the thorns. Mm -hmm. And He said, uh, when they have heard, go out and are choked. Yep. And he, sp he specifies, first, the cares of this world, right. 
and then riches, and then the pleasures of life. Maybe for just a moment or two, talk about, because I know in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul had something to say about the danger of riches yeah. and how that can encroach upon our faith. And so again, we're talking about why do people lose their faith? And, and again, some say, well, you can't lose your faith, but Jesus is saying you can. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying you can. So what about the riches of this world? You know, Mark's account, chapter 4, talks about those sown among the thorns. Hear the word and the cares of this world. And watch this, the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Something's deceitful about riches. What is so deceitful about them? They seem to indicate total security, that if I have riches, I'm secure once and for all. But the Proverbs writer says, labor not to be rich, because they have wings and it'll fly away. That's Someone right. noted on the back of a one dollar bill, there are wings there that ought to remind us that riches tend to fly away. And uh, they're so fleeting. That's, That's right. one of the deceitful things about riches. You th you're rich one day and you think, I'm set. I'm set for life. And so even if you were set for this life, you're not set for the next life right. because Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven. And some folks spend a whole lot of time accumulating earthly treasures only to leave them behind. And as Ecclesiastes points out, a fool may be the uh, one who receives those right. riches and squanders away your life's mm -hmm. work. And so there's got to be something better than riches. First uh, Timothy 6, 7, we brought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing out. J. Pierpont Morgan was one of the greatest financiers of Wall Street uh, in his time. And when he died, businessmen from all over came to New York City to see his remains. And as one of them was walking by, he said to his buddy, he said, reckon how much he left behind. And his buddy said, he left it all behind. And of course, that's not the question the man was asking. He wanted to assign a dollar value to what this man had. And his buddy said, look, does it really matter? Because whatever the amount was, he doesn't have it with him. That's exactly right. And, and BJ, you know, Jesus asked the question, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. So really, what you have here is of little consequence in terms of really what you need to do is make sure that your trust is in God and not in uncertain riches. Jesus in John 6, 27, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that which endureth unto everlasting life. That's right. And those people in John 6 were following Jesus for the temporal blessings that He might be able to give them uh, for the loaves and the fishes. And Jesus said, that's not where it's at. You, you follow me, right. follow after the teaching that I give. You take that into your system, absorb that into your spiritual system, and that's what will give you life. That's exactly right. B.J., you mentioned a moment ago the uncertainty of riches and how sometimes riches give people a false sense of security. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul said, charge, command those who are rich in this present world not to be haughty, nor to trust, listen to him, in uncertain riches, mm -hmm. but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And then he talks about how if you have a lot, you ought to be benevolent with that, help sure. others. But going back to verse 9, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Yeah. And then he said, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have erred or strayed from the faith. Right in their greediness There's the reason. and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So, B.J., can riches cause a person to lose their faith? If you listen to the Apostle Paul, and he was an inspired writer, he's saying, look, you need to be very careful. The riches of this world can encroach upon your faith, yeah. and you can lay it to, a, lay it to the side. We've, we've known people that have allowed the things of this world to come between them and their relationship to God. Right. As a result of that, their focus is on the temporal rather than the eternal. Story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man has it all, fared sumptuously every day, clothed in the finest clothing. Lazarus can't even get some crumbs. He, all he wants are crumbs. Just crumbs would be nice. And yet uh, when they die, their situations are completely flipped and reversed as far as who's considered rich. 
And no wonder the Bible talks about being rich toward God as being the thing that I should right. seek. Because seeing that all these things shall be dissolved <laughs> uh, when this world burns up someday, what manner of persons ought you to be? These lifestyles of the rich and famous shows show you the most lavish homes and automobiles and uh, the furnishings are amazing. And every one of those celebrities will die someday and leave it to someone else. That's right. Or the world will end first and that house that is so glorified <clears throat> is going to be burned up. So then what? Uh, it, it's not worth it to put my trust in uncertain riches right. because uh, those things, I can't take them with me. Well, so well said. B.J., another characteristic of, I guess another characteristic that laws, causes people to lose their faith, the world. Yes. In First John chapter 2, John said, Love not the world, neither the things which are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he provides us insight into the tools that are used by the devil to appeal to people. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He said, not of the Father, but it's of the world. You, you spoke a moment ago about Demas, a casualty of the world. Wonder how many people have, taken prison, have been taken prisoner by the devil through the world. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. What was it that the devil used to appeal to Mother Eve? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, what tastes good, the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, what looks good, the lust of the eyes. And that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, what makes me look good, the pride of life. First John 2. And then you go fast forward to Jesus. How did the devil try to tempt the very Son of God? Same you know way. he's going to bring out all he's got to try to bring down the Son of God. And what did he try to bring out? Command that these stones be made bread. Wouldn't that taste good right now after you fasted? There's the lust of the flesh. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the lust of the eyes. If you're really the Son of God, then do what I say, the pride of life, prove yourself to be some, on and on. Same methods. Try. And so Satan has not had to change his playbook That's because right. we never seem to get the memo about what causes people to go astray. And Esau was a profane person because he longed for immediate gratification and was willing to trade future blessings right. for immediate gratification. And we think, how barbaric. And yet, you know what? We've got folks doing the very same thing. They're trading eternal expectations for earthly Temporal. pleasures that give immediate temporary gratification. That's exactly right. And B.J., you know, in looking at 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and, and you look at the insidious way that Satan operates, and, and the world is, in, in many respects, hedonistic. It is humanistic.